Today we study Maxwell's equations. Before we study Maxwell's equations, we need to review divergence theorem and the Stokes theorem. These two theorems are very important to derive the differential form of the Maxwell's equations. First, we study the gradient, divergence, and curve. A vector field V, the field, field is a function of field like electric field, magnetic field. Field is a function of X, where X is the coordinate, Cartesian coordinates of the displacement vector position vector in space. If it is depending on x only, that is a time-independent field. If it depends both on time and spatial coordinate, then we say that time-dependent field. The position, position vector is expressed in terms of the three coordinates. Uh, today, we would rather use x1 for x, x2 for y, and x3 for z coordinate. And the basis vector for x, y, z coordinates were defined to be i, j, and k hat that we use e1 hat e2 hat and e3 hat if we use these notation then the expression becomes a quite compact vector we should correct this one with the V1, V2, and V3. And vector field is a linear combination of three components, and these three components are, for example, V1 is not only a function of uh, x1, but also a function of three coordinates. The V2 is a function of three coordinates, and V3 is a function of three coordinates. So it is too busy, so we have better to use vi x vector. This indicates that i runs from 1 to 3. The electric field and magnetic fields are vector fields. Yes, right. Gradient operator. Gradient operator, we learned that it is I partial derivative of X, partial derivative of Y, and this one. But if we use E1, E2, E3, then we can express it this way, and we can make use of the summation notation, Ei hat, now that's I, 
sum over i. The gradient operator acts on a scalar field. Scalar field phi is a function of x1, x2, and x3. And gradient, if I, if we multiply, if we apply the differential operator called gradient and put the negative sign on it on the electrostatic field, then we, we have electric field. The first component, E1, the x is this one, or if you use this notation, is x1, 5. So for i equals 1, 2, 3, it is ei equals minus derivative with respect to xi, something like that. This is a gradient operator. Next, we consider divergence. Divergence operator. If we understand the divergence theorem, we will notice that why this operator is called divergence. Right now, we had better memorize the divergence of V equals x component x derivative y component y derivative and z component z derivative sum this is called the divergence and if you use the i equals 1 to 3 notation sum over i i runs from 1 to 3 the i Derivative with respect to xi and sum, sum, sum them out. So this is divergence. The next <coughs> next we consider curve. Uh, before we consider curve divergence. Divergence B, divergence B is in case of V is uh, radiating in this fraction, the like, uh, vector field radiating from a point, then this one is a positive. If something, if the vector field is coming into some place from everywhere, then it becomes negative. So divergence is the, this kind of structure. Next, we consider curve. Curve. Is along some direction, magnetic field, current I, then magnetic field is uh, rotating. In that case, we say curve B. So the unit vector is N, is proportional to N. Okay. The field is rotating, then the, norm, the surface of the vector, normal to that surface vector, surrounded by this curve is this and rotating vector field has non-vanishing curve along the direction to the, the normal vector on the surface
that calculation can be that one is defined by for example core v is a sum of i hat j hat k hat components i hat x component sub y z and z y y component y z cyclic z x and x z z component x y y x that is uh, this is the definition of curve and if we use the one two three notation is the first component is two three minus the three two and second component is a three one one three with negative sign third component is three one two minus two one summation notation can be used so e i hat x j derivative and the k where there is an over sign first of all they must be i j k uh, permutation of one two three if it is even if it is even one two three two three one three one two these are even these three are even permutations and these three are odd permutations say this is one three two two one three and the three two one they are all the permutations so even permutation we we multiply plus one odd permutation we multiply minus one this kind of function is levis civita symbol epsilon i j k is one minus one or zero it's the even permutation odd permutation permutation non-permutation so any if any two of the indices are the same then it becomes zero therefore we we use this notation for sum over i j k electric field from electrostatic potential electrostatic potential due to a point charge at the origin at point R at point X whose length is defined by R is expressed in this way in order to compute the electric field corresponding to the, the this electrostatic potential we need to compute the minus the gradient potential so we we use chain rule to find the electric field because this uh, phi of x is depending only on the radius the magnitude so we use chain rule to take the derivative of this phi with respect to r and use apply gradient to this function the r
So let us compute the electric field from the electrostatic potential. Q over 4 pi epsilon 0 is a constant. So we, have, we concentrate on 1 over R. Before taking the gradient operator to 1 over R, we first compute the gradient R. To compute the gradient R, it's better to compute the coordinate. So first, we apply the gradient operator to a single coordinate. For example, we take the gradient of x. So i, x derivative, j, y derivative, k, z derivative, for x. We notice that these two vanishes because x is a, x depends only on x. So hence it is just unit vector i. In a similar manner, this is j and gradient z equals unit vector log k. In summary, gradient of xi is the unit vector along the i direction. But this is based on this partial derivative. So xk is partial derivative with respect to a coordinate is 1 or 0. If i equals j, if i is not equal to j. Next, we consider the derivative of r with respect to a coordinate. r is square root x square plus y square plus z square. If I take the derivative of r with respect to x, we, we use chain rule. This r is a square root, square root a, so this is derivative of square root of a multiplied by the partial derivative of a with respect to x, where a is x square, y square, z square. This is 2 square root of a in the denominator, and this one is these two vanishes, so this is 2x. Hence, we have 2x, the 2 to cancel, x, this is a square root, x square, y square, z square. So this is x over r. As a reserve, this is xi over because this this one is the same as this so x y z finally
finally we now this was this and we compute the derivative of this with respect to xi again we use the chain rule because of this we, we have as a result gradient phi is this one multiplied by you know gradient phi equals to ei and ei xi sum over i this is x vector therefore it is unit vector along the r direction simple Because phi, phi has over a vector q over for pi epsilon, and we have one over r is the core. So gradient one over r is and this one is a minus or a bar square unit vector. Electric field is minus gradient. Minus gradient 1 over r is plus 1 over r squared unit vector. Therefore, we conclude that the electric field phi if phi equals q over 4 pi epsilon 0 times 1 over r, then the electric field is like that. Divergence of electric field. Now, we have a phi the electric field and unit vector and then we compute that this is minus a gradient phi and now we compute the divergence of the electric field divergence of the electric field we notice that the electric field radiates from the origin where the charge is placed radiates so we expect the divergence divergence is not vanishing at that point We are well acquainted with uh, this expression because uh, when we compute the uh, electric field by taking the minus gradient of the electrostatic potential, we, we have the similar expression. But we, what we have now is 1 over r, our unit vector, that is 1 over uh, r squared. 1 of r squared and x vector divided by r. That means we have x i e i hat sum over i in the numerator and the denominator is r cube. So electric field, the i component of the electric field 
is q over 4 pi epsilon 0 and xi over rq. This is the one we have to compute the divergence. So divergence E equals Q over 4 pi epsilon 0 and sum over I. So we have to compute this. So before we sum over I, we first compute this one. If I take the derivative, then this is a product of xi, so 1 of r cube. So we take the derivative of product, so we first take the derivative of a first factor and multiply 1 of r cube. And next, we leave it as it is, as xi. So this is 1, therefore we have 1 of r cube. This is a xi derivative. And this one can be evaluated in this way. This is xi r drt 1 of r cube. So, this one is this one is xi over r, and the next one is minus the three. This one is minus the three r to the fourth power. So three xi and we have minus sign one of r to the fourth power. If we combine these two exponents, then we are to the fifth power. As a result, the first term is a 1 of r cube, and second term is a minus, we have the additional effect of xi, this is multiplied to this xi to make xi squared. We have to add these three terms. Add these three terms, OI runs from 1 to 3. So we have a 1 over R cube and minus 3xi squared over R to the fifth power sum of Y. And if I add this one three times, 3 over R cube minus 3x1 squared, x2 squared, x3 squared. Okay, this one is actually r squared. Therefore, the second term in the brackets becomes 3 over r cubed. They are equal. Therefore, it is 0. Where the derivative can be evaluated only for the case at which the function is defined. But as r goes to 0, E is not defined. It is a strictly divergent. So this is for R is not zero. Therefore, electric field is divergence E equals zero in free space for. equals zero. However, we know that the electric field is 
divergent from this origin. Therefore, we have to we have to find some other way to find the value of divergence at the singularity is present. Divergence of theorem. We are concentrated on the electric field. The electric field is proportional to the radial vector over r squared, or x vector divided by x vector cubed. In that case, divergence E was a zero for all x is non-zero. We evaluate the volume integral of the divergence over a space containing the origin. Origin, and we choose some arbitrary volume. But except for the tiny space that includes the origin, everywhere else divergence is zero. Therefore, this integral is very simple because this volume integral is separated into two pieces plus v minus v0 divergence e dx1 dx2 dx3 dx3 but this one is vanishing when the origin is not included this is a v minus a v0 and this one is a v0 therefore this volume integral is greatly simplified so we we we, we can evaluate in a small space we can we can choose a very simple volume that contains the origin a cube introduce a cube this is the origin we have x y and z this delta and this side is delta and along the z direction this side is also delta so this is a Q we consider this Q region of X Region of y and z are all from minus one half of delta to plus one half of delta. We could have chosen a different volume, but this is the simplest volume that contains the origin where divergence E uh, seems to be non zero. Then the integral is expressed in terms of a small integral, a small volume over v0 and this v0 integral is evaluated from uh, for x1, x2 and x3 in the same interval and divergence E is explicitly written x components x derivative, y components y derivative and z components z derivative for example, the first term, this is a derivative with respect to x1, so it is a trivial to evaluate the x1 integral among these three-dimensional integrals. We carry out x integral, then what we find is the e1, so 
upper bound is this and lower bound and subtract as we know this is f of b minus f of a this trivial relation in a similar manner we can carry out x2 integral for the second term so second term x2 integral is carried out and subtracted upper bound minus lower bound keeping x1 x3 unintegrated in a similar manner the third term x3 is integrated over what we find now is an interesting stage for example 2 3 this is x direction x equals one half delta one half delta and the other surface this is toward the negative direction this is x equals minus one half delta we find that this integral the first term this integral is evaluated over this region and multiplied by this area vector heading toward the positive x-axis so this first term in the brackets is the surface of the integral surface integral of the electric field on this surface and second term is evaluated on the x value is minus one half delta and integrate over x2 and x3 y and z y is it plane but we have negative sign this negative sign stands for the direction of the surface that is heading opposite to this positive direction therefore without approximation it is exact it is a, the relation is exact to find that the surface integral evaluate on this x equals minus one half delta in the similar manner y direction we have y direction positive and negative so y equals one half of delta y equals minus one half of delta that is in here the third pair is the g direction this is z equals one half of delta and opposite direction at z equals minus one half delta so these are six terms one two three four five six terms contribute to the surface integral parallel to the x-axis parallel to the y-axis and parallel to the z-axis these six faces are the surface of the q and each surface element has the direction like that so this is the electric field, electric field, electric field integrated over the surface instead of the volume. Finally, it is divergence volume integral over volume is. the same integral
over volume, very tiny volume that contains the origin, V0. And then this one is identical to the surface integral of the electric field. And the surface is the boundary of V0. Okay. And this one can be done with these for the space where the light uh, divergence vanishes. So this one was a surface of V0 of the electric field. Surface, and this is 0 but this can be extended to an arbitrary volume as long as the origin is included. Where V minus V0 divergence E dx dx2 dx3 equals E dot V dot D sigma equal all 0. So in general, any electric field, divergence, any divergence of the electric field is the electric field's surface integral. This is called the divergence theorem. Divergence theorem can be applied to verify the Gauss law. Electric field due to a point charge placed at the origin has the divergence that whose divergence can be integrated over the space and because of the divergence theorem that is the electric field's flux integra integration over the surface the surface is the boundary of that volume. An electric field is a radial and surface area, surface element, and if we consider a sphere of radius r, we have polar angle theta and we have an azimuthal angle. Phi, and this is right angle, and this is R, this is R, and this is theta. So Z component this one is R cosine theta, and this radial, planar radial radius rho is R sine theta. We can construct uh, a surface element, surface element with polar angle theta, then because there is a radius, angle B theta is corresponds to the length of the arc with R D theta. And this is a Z direction. The rotation about the Z direction with the angle D phi because the this perpendicular radius is a rho that is a R sine theta this arc length is r sine theta d phi. So r d theta times r sine theta d phi is the area of this uh, patch. So the sigma that is along the radial direction, along the radial direction, has the magnitude. 
So V dot D sigma, this R hat, R hat, they are parallel, and R square in the denominator for the electric field, R square in the numerator for the aerial element, this product, so E dot D sigma is greatly simplified as Q over 4 pi epsilon 0 sine theta D theta D phi. So theta is integrated from here to there. The theta is 0 to pi and we have phi azimuthal angle that is rotating to pi. Phi 0 to 2 pi. So, phi integrals to pi, and we have theta integral from 0 to pi, but sine theta d theta equals minus d cosine theta. So, finally, this integral is just a 2. And phi integral has a 2 pi. So, product of this will be 4 pi. The 4 pi cancels and this surface integral over a closed surface that contains a closed surface that is the sphere of radius r centered at the origin is q of epsilon 0. That is the Gauss law. So Gauss law is proved by making use of divergence theorem. Next, we consider Stokes' theorem to compute uh, the, to consider the Ampere's law. Let us continue to study the Stokes theorem. The two-dimensional version of the Stokes theorem is Green's theorem. Consider a function defined in the two-dimensional plane, an xy plane. A has a two components, a1 and a2. And we consider a line integral. And this our line integral along a closed curve is the same as this is the third component of a curve. The third component of a curve when af uh, after we replace this V with A. So it's better to compute the right side and simplify the right side to find that it is equivalent to the left hand side. This one, let us first compute the first component. It is uh, very similar to the proof of divergence theorem because it, this is a derivative. One of the integral, this x1 integral, can be removed and it remains with the x2 integral only. In the second term, x2 derivative can be removed by taking the integral over x2 then the next term depends on you know, the x1 integral, single dimensional integral. First compute, let us compute the first term, x2 the, uh, derivative with respect to x1. This x1 integral is uh, evaluated on the surface. This is the surface, the surface integral. And if we carry out x1 integral, it carry out x, x1 integral, this x1 integral runs from this point to there, depending on the x2 value. x2 ranges from x2 minimum to x2 maximum. And somewhere around it for given x2, it has x1 minimum depending on x2, x1 maximum. So x1 minimum from x1 minimum to x1 maximum, this integral is on the band with the 
small this thickness is the dx2 we carry out this integral then this uh, derivative is uh, removed and x a2 survives and uh, upper bound is replaced with the value of x1 and subtracted by the lower bound and lower bound <coughs> x1 is replaced with the lower bound this lower bound of uh, x1 depending on x2 so we, we then carry out the uh, x2 integral so at this point this is at this point and this one is this point so if we carry out x2 integral this one x1 max from x2 minimum this one becomes this curve and then this second term second term this integral is uh, from x to minimum to maximum so it goes like that and we have negative sign so flip the direction then the next term including negative sign including negative sign this curve completes the loop so subtraction is actually the same this integral is over a closed over a closed uh, path that encloses the surface on the xy plane and this is like a2 second component and the integra integration is over x2 so so over a closed path the integral is dx2 x a2 in a similar manner, we can verify that this integral, the second integral, this one, is over a closed path again. But in that case, x2 integral, x2 integral is removed and we end with x1 integral. The answer is integral over closed path of dx1 a1 some of this these two terms some of these two terms leads to dx1 a1 dx2 a2 along the same path these are the same path these are the same path so this closed path this is the closed path this one This thing we have better use okay. Actually, this is the case where A, A is on the xy plane. This can be generalized because this is a core A's third component. We, we, we can see curve 
is third component dx1 dx2 this can be cur a the third component and areas third component perpendicular direction e3 hat d sigma 3 if I combine everything all together to hat d sigma 2 E1 hat D sigma 1 is defined to be arbitrary surface. So we can combine three components. Cur A's third component D sigma 3 and so on. Cur A's first component D sigma 1. Cur A's second component d sigma 2 and so on in that case d this is just the core a is scalar product with arbitrary surface over over a surface that is along the curve close to curve that path is the boundary of surface a dot dx. So generalization of this green theorem is called Stokes theorem. And detailed uh, verification is listed in below and you can follow that calculation. Now let us make use of divergent theorem to consider Gauss law, differential form of the Gauss law. This is the Gauss law. And we apply the divergence theorem. This flux integral on the surface can be converted into the volume integral of divergence of this vector field. And the left hand side, this is a charge. This charge can be expressed as 1 over epsilon 0 multiplied by charge density integrated over volume and this is the divergence integrated over the volume so these are these two are the same so we substitute this one in here and this one in here and subtract the right side from the left hand side then expression becomes like that. Any function integrated over a volume is a zero. If you read, if you allow V to be very small, tiny volume, then in this volume it becomes a divergence e minus rho minus epsilon zero. This integrand can be constant at that point and multiplied by volume equals zero because this volume although this volume is not uh, is a tiny it is non-zero but the product is zero therefore we we find that this integrand is vanishing so divergence e equals rho over epsilon zero. This is true everywhere, including the origin. So we end up with the differential form of Gauss law. And this is called the Maxwell's equation. There are four Maxwell's equations, but one of the equation is this that corresponds to the differential form of Gauss law. We know the magnet consists of north and south pole. They are always combined. Dipole. 
in the electric field case we have charge density then means we have either positive or negative if excess of uh, positive or negative the charge density survives however dipole is uh, charge and opposite charge equal amount combination so rho equals zero for magnetic field therefore divergence of theorem for the electric field is rho over epsilon zero but divergence of theorem for magnetic field because the density is always zero These two are the Maxwell's equations. Corresponding to Gauss law for electric and magnetic fields. The non existence of the magnetic monopole leads to divergence B equals zero. Next we consider Ampere Maxwell Ampere law. This is the Faraday's law. Of induction of electric induced electric field. Magnetic flux B can be phi B can be evaluated over a surface like that. And electric field over a closed path C can be evaluated on the surface. whose boundary is that closed path by making use of Stokes theorem. And this surface, this surface, they are the same. So move this one, but after taking the derivative, because this is a space spatial variable and it's time dependent variable so d phi b negative sign so it is partial derivative of magnetic field because here before in take uh, before taking the integral so spatial variables are fixed so only the time variable is varied so this total derivative is replaced with the partial derivative inside integral therefore if we move this one to the left side and combine with this we have per e plus time derivative magnetic field multiplied by as a scalar product so surface integral as we have done with gauss law we if we shrink the surface into tiny space, then it is uh, factorized into curl E minus plus this one multiplied by the surface area, tiny surface area, because it is zero, because zero and it is non-zero, this one must be zero. So we end up with the end up with. differential form form of Faraday's law as a last step we consider the Ampere's law Ampere's law looks very similar to this just to replace the electric field with magnetic field. However, there is a mu zero constant appears, I enclosed, 
current I, there is a closed path, and closed path encloses I enclosed. If it encloses a current, then there is a magnetic field around the current. However, we do not have the time derivative of flux. In the case of electric field, changing magnetic field flux produced electric field. However, in here, um, if we ignore the charge density, for example, if we are in a free space, even the electric field has divergence vanishing because rho is a zero in free space, then electric field equation, magnetic field equation is identical to each other. So very similar. So why not? Maxwell Maxwell added additional piece that copies except for the negative sign on it copies the relationship between the Faraday's law. So this is Faraday's law of induced induced electric field induced by magnetic field. This is a Maxwell's law Maxwell's law for magnetic field induced by electric field and the addition of the electric field flux the expression is modified that we have extra current and that we have additional current that is called the displacement current and this displacement current is defined like that while the current is the, the surface integral over current density here displacement current density is epsilon zero partial time derivative of electric field this is the current density corresponding to the displacement current you shall find that what what it means shortly anyway combining everything all together we end up with the maxwell ampere's law this is this is ampere's law and this is maxwell's law so this is actual current current related to current and this is related to displacement current and displacement current is actually this current I is flowing magnetic field is produced around the real current and the current is flowing into the parallel plate capacitor then we have charge Q is accumulated, charge minus Q is accumulated. Between the two plates, no current. However, the actual magnetic field, B field, B field exists. And the amount is, the amount is the same as outside outside the plate, the amount of magnetic field is the same. This one and this one the same. That means there is a no current, but there is a current is, is it is not a current, there must be a current like consistent with current that produces the magnetic field. And because of the current charge accumulation and we know the electric field between the two plates is 
sigma over epsilon zero. And sigma is epsilon zero a q over charge q is accumulated and q is increasing, the electric field is increasing. Therefore, displacement current is related to the electric field. And you know, epsilon zero a e equals q over a. And epsilon zero e a equals q time derivative q zero time derivative area is i aha uh -huh. this is current coming into the plate but there is no current between the two plates but the same amount current like one is increasing with the same amount so this this one is related to displacement current All right. That's the reason why displacement current is uh, of this kind of form. And detailed derivation of the displacement current is on this and next page. The magnets, Earth is a magnet, North Pole is uh, attracted by the South Pole, Compass North Pole is attracted by South Pole, that's the reason why they, they have an orientation aligned to the North Pole of the earth we summarize everything all together we have the gauss law integral form of the gauss law we have differential form of the gauss law We have epsilon zero in epsilon zero here. The magnetic field case Gauss law equals zero means no monopole, no magnetic monopole. Faraday's law, differential form of the Faraday's law and Ampere's law and Maxwell's law in combination Maxwell Ampere's law the differential form of Maxwell Ampere's law and this is if there is a no paraplate capacitor accumulation of charge this one is Ampere's law This is an advanced topic. Uh, you can go ahead to find out the electric field due to the changing magnetic field can be included in the, this is the electrostatic potential, the changing magnetic field that produced the electric field that is due to the vector potential A. And the magnetic field is always expressed in terms of curl of a vector potential. Later we will study in quantum mechanics, it, it will help. The orbital motion of an electron can be computed and actually the electron is negative charge, orbital angular momentum 
an electric charge, so the di magnetic dipole moment of the electron rotating in a circular motion with its classical approximation is does have a magnetic dipole that magnetic dipole is opposite opposite to the orbital angular moment that's quite important we will study the quantization of orbital angular momentum later not in this section seriously so just remember because the electric the electron has a negatively charged particle orbital angular momentum and orbital angular momentum generates a magnetic dipole they are opposite direction and one can compute the magnetic dipole of the orbit and you can compute the ratio and the, this is marvelously it is consistent with the quantum mechanical measurement in addition even though there is a no physical movement of the electron if electron at rest even has a magnetic dipole that magnetic dipole is called the spin magnetic moment magnetic dipole moment due to spin we also consider this later when we study the quantum mechanics in the later part of this semester and just remember the ball magneton is defined by this okay that's it for today